This is K-12 Tech Talk. K-12 Tech Talk. The podcast by K-12 Techs for K-12 Techs. Real conversations, real arguments, and real banter on trending K-12 technology topics and issues. Live from somethingcool.com studios, this is the K-12 Tech Talk podcast. I am Josh, with me tonight, making fun of me, I believe, because I stepped away for a few minutes, is Mark. Hi. And Chris. Hello. So, episode 144, we are, let's see, it's the week before Thanksgiving. You guys have any major projects going on, getting ready for Thanksgiving break? I am uh, in the middle of swapping out. Our HP switches to extreme, uh, all the rest of them. We did a major project over summer, most of our MDFs. Uh, so now uh, we have a company on site uh, tomorrow, today, tomorrow, and Monday. Uh, we have fall break next week, uh, swapping out all the rest, all the IDFs and any MDFs that were missed. Does that count as um, extremes ad for the show? It probably should because okay. it's been going so, well so far. Um, if you have extreme switches, let me give this model number, and I'm not going to be crabby about this, Chris. Um, oh, I can't find it. I think it's 6350s switches. Um, you used to have to license 10 gig ports. Um, you had to buy the license to get, take them from one gig to 5320s. Sorry. Uh, you had to buy the license to take them for, from a one gig port to a 10 gig co- uh, fiber port. I was told this evening that if you upgrade to firmware version 32.6, fabric release nine, that all of those ports are enabled to 10 gig by default. No more buying the license. Nice. So if you're an extreme customer, go do that. I will be doing that over Christmas. Nice. So. You can email dmayer at extremenetworks.com to learn more. Tell him thank you for telling us about that. Um, let's see. What else? Do we just jump right into the news? This Maybe. Is, this is a quick banter. I don't know that we've ever been done with lead in this early. We're ready for break. Wow. Yeah. Mark, you got any, any Thanksgiving break? Are you taking time off for deer season, going deer hunting? Uh, no. No, I'm traveling, uh, right. heading heading out your your way to the Midwest to uh, to visit some family so for Thanksgiving. So hey, I think we'll only be like a couple hours away, Mark. Mm. Yeah, something like that. I'm in Indiana for Thanksgiving, yeah. so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that's about right. Four hours guys. away. Okay, okay. I'll I'll say hi. Maybe we'll so, meet up. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's the next episode. Down. So, news. Go on, Mark. Bring I would in. like to eat. Oh, we oh, should we, we should accomplish that at some point. Have Thanksgiving dinner like, together. Yeah, and just to put this out there, like my family, um, Thanksgiving we never just do like Chris's side of the family or Stephanie's side. For years and years, it's like blended family. There's usually a random other person that no one really knows there. Um, like we have friends over the whole bit. So, I mean, you guys should come on over. I'd we love are, to break bread with you guys. We are uh, host, hosting my parents and my in-laws because my in-laws used to go to Kansas to see my wife's grandmother, and uh, she's not around anymore. So we are hosting both sets of parents at our house on Thanksgiving. You guys do turkey, ham, or both? Turkey. It's Thanksgiving. This is not a heathen household. Mark, what do you guys do? Turkey. Do you what, have any? What else is there? Do you have any other meats? We have chicken and dumplings. Like we're, I'm smoking some ribs. <laughs> do you guys do that? No, no. I, I no, okay. I didn't know. The, okay, I didn't, I didn't know the pilgrim smoked ribs. Yeah, Mark, is that a, is that a, historically accurate? Because that's your neck of the woods. You get it really is. upset when we talk about New England and get it wrong. Uh, no. So Plymouth is a little bit south of where I am right now. That's where they settled. 
uh, you can actually go and see Plymouth Rock. It is the, um, I will say, like the New Englanders, like massive prank on tourists is to go visit Plymouth Rock. Because when you think of Plymouth Rock, what do you what do you think it looks like? I've heard Big it's rock. like a stone, like a pebble. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a pretty small stone. So people kind of go there, and it's very very underwhelming. And so that's our that's our that's a joke we like to play on people. Is, I'm glad you didn't play that joke on us when we came to visit you. No, nah, no, nah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that to you guys. So, but all right, all right. I guess it's time for the news, news boy. Once you bring it on in. News. Come on up here, news boy. <laughs> uh, we actually just, it's all government news today. So uh, the government. FCC <laughs> has released their pilot cybersecurity. Uh, a little bit more details on it. I wouldn't say we have the full details of it yet, but uh, they had a news release on the proposal to add a cybersecurity pilot program. The details are a little bit sketchy at this point, but uh, we do know that there will be an investment of up to $200 million over three years. Um, that, and this is a, the kind of the, the big thing for me, it will be separate from the E-rate program. Uh, so this will not be competing necessarily with the E-rate program, although I think there are still some concerns that, you know, you're still, you're just slicing the pie in a different way. Uh, so... There's some details that were uh, released a little bit more, um, but at least we know that we are starting a pilot um, and they are gonna be uh, really focusing on uh, cybersecurity, looking to learn about like what more cybersecurity services schools will need, as well as advanced fiber, uh, firewall services. Uh, so I think the part of it is establishing a fund and the other part of it is trying to find what's the best use of those funds. So thoughts on that i know we've talked about this one in the past i'm curious to see uh if your opinions of this have changed or not josh this has irritates, a thought this yes this irritates me um and probably more than irritates and probably more than it should mm. but yeah uh like maybe chafing would be a good this chafes me um here's my take on this so i was on an msi sac call when i guess this news broke because one of the guys on the panel was talking the email just came out more or less what mark said 200 million over a three-year period and they're uh i guess he said that they are um not earmarking it but people with the highest frl rates will get first dibs so you know your schools with 85 90 percent frl are going to take up that lion's share of that 200 million dollars over this three-year period what what frustrates me or chafes me the most about this is we get this a couple weeks ago we get this willy-nilly announcement that now bus wi-fi is e-rate eligible i don't know anyone that was asking for that um <laughs> now we're going to delay cybersecurity function which everyone has been screaming for for the last couple of years you know there's those several different uh petitions that were signed people are clamoring for this so what do they do they take 200 million and say over the next three years we're going to study this so read into that there won't be any official decision to expand the uh eligible service list for at least three years for everyone else but by god we have bus wi-fi like Plus, I, Wi-Fi is pretty cool. Give me a break. Mm, yeah, I have some thoughts on bus Wi-Fi. It's it works in certain areas, but I don't think it's a universal strategy for for bringing internet to students' homes. No. Um, during during COVID, it made a little bit of sense to go park a bus in a neighborhood, maybe. Um, but just running Wi-Fi on a bus route home, those kid, a a bus of eighty five children are not sitting down doing homework on the bus ride home or the bus ride in. It's going to be your long haul sports trips, you know, because that's what K-12 ex exists for is for football and basketball. Man, um, you're on a rant right now. I, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, uh, yeah, I don't give me a break. Bus Wi-Fi, E-rate eligible and let's sit on cybersecurity for three years. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Bus Wi-Fi fits easily into things that are already approved, though. Like, we already approved Wi-Fi. We already approved network connectivity. So that was the easy, like, throw in there. But Cybersecurity it, is a new, like, thing. Like no, a new category make, or whatever. No, no I, I disagree 
with cybersecurity being a new category. Firewalls have been eligible yeah. for eons. Allow the damn updates and support and all that stuff that those next gen items that they that they right. removed from my FCDL that you could just as easily say that's now eligible as they did stinking bus Wi-Fi. Yeah, you're right because we banter about that before. I want to if I want a Palo Alto next gen firewall, I can get that through E rate. But I can't get the services that make it great. No, you, uh, to, you to go along with it. You're wrong. You want a Fortinet next generation firewall. Oh, Fortinet, a proud sponsor of the K12 Tech Talk podcast. Yes. So yeah, bus. I, I understand internet access equity. I completely get that. And I think their their point with this was making hotspots eligible. Mark, mm-hmm. correct me if I'm wrong. And hotspots being the it it seems like a panacea to address ec- internet ec- equity at home in a in a area that might be underserved or uh due to social economical issues i can see that but to to have like article headlines be bus wi-fi is now eligible yeah no that no I, I don't know. I feel like it's a little bit more of a like a pat on the back kind of thing in terms of bus Wi-Fi because it I mean, I think about I mean, I don't I don't ride a school bus every day, but when I'm on an airplane and there's airplane Wi-Fi, I'm not like fantastic. Now I can sit here and do work and homework. Like, right. No, I'm watching the next episode of of The Office, you know, like and you're I texting feel like, us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I, I just don't feel like the bus Wi-Fi is the best use of our time or our funds. Uh, or or it's going to have the most meaningful impact. I feel like a lot of people got to the FCC and said, this is a great thing, or it sounds really cool. But in in reality, I just don't think it's going to have that much of an impact. No. And, and it's maybe- trendy. Like during COVID times, it was the very trendy thing. Like, yes. yeah, yeah, we're deploying our buses to give everybody Wi-Fi in, in their yeah. homes, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, no, I got asked the same thing of like, oh, during COVID, are we going to park our buses and, and make the Wi-Fi available? I was like, we're in New England. Do you want kids to come out and hang out with their laptops <laughs> in a cold environment and we got to run the bus and like drain the gas? Like it right. just practically speaking it just doesn't make sense, but 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 then you're a naysayer, anyways. Mark, and you're a poo-pooer. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It, so. I guess if you look at it from the financial aspect of it, it's probably from a dollars and cents standpoint it's an easier gimme to say bus Wi-Fi because how much money is really going to be spent on bus Wi-Fi out of that big E-rate bucket right. versus the amount of money that could be spent on cyber, you know, if next-gen firewall or EDR services, if they add that, yeah. you you could easily blow a lot more money with cyber than you could with bus Wi-Fi because nobody's going to do it. Yeah, I don't know with if bus Wi-Fi, if anybody was like, Yes, we can finally do bus Wi-Fi. I don't know. You look on LinkedIn. There's, there's, of course, vendors out there clamoring over it, but it has got some positive press. Which maybe I shouldn't be surprised because you know everybody's got their own need, and I get that. Our my need is not the same as Chris's need or Mark's need. Um, so I shouldn't try. I shouldn't judge it like that. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's not taking much of the pie. I no. don't think. No, you're right. You either want bus Wi-Fi or you don't, and I don't think a majority are going to go for bus Wi-Fi. And and if you look at it in the realm of your pie is based on your student population, right. yeah. and you can yeah. only spend the dollars that you have based in that allocation, then okay. But yeah, you whatever. Could, but again, you could make the same argument for sci- if, if you want to spend your allocation on cyber stuff. Okay, that that's what you're picking to spend your your allocation on. I just, I don't know, within weeks of each other saying this, you know, hey, best Wi-Fi, and then, oh, we're going to wait three years for cyber for everyone. Yeah. Um, it's really just a pilot. It's a very, very, very small pilot. Yeah, too. for and a three-year pilot. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope you guys so, don't apply for it, and I'll take all the money. I. It's going to be interesting well, to see how that works. But, but it also, you know... I, I'm in the mindset of like, I think the uh, USAC and the FCC should be protecting the internet access and resources that they're putting to school. So I'm sure. fully on board with cybersecurity. Absolutely. I think this is, I think this is too small and too 
spread out. Josh, though, is like, no, on the cybersecurity side, like, stop dividing the pie and and keep it focused. So no, no, I I support the cybersecurity yeah. making cybersecurity items eligible on the list. That I'm a hundred percent behind that. I'm not in favor of. I'm almost cussed. Dragging your feet, <laughs> okay. dragging okay. your feet, okay. not your behind for three years to make a decision that makes it eligible for everyone else besides the people in this pilot program, which, got it, got and again, it. I'm reading into this. Maybe that's not going to happen, but when someone comes out and says, we're going to do a three-year pilot program with $200 million, you, logic would say yeah. nothing is going to happen until that three-year pilot is over. Yeah, yeah. But again, maybe I'm wrong. Because I'm I'm not privy to any insider information. <laughs> Josh would really like to be in the room where it happens. Yes, so. that's my goal, Mark. <laughs> Do you remember when there was that when that petition went around for schools to sign about cybersecurity for E rate? Yeah. Yeah. And heated. we signed it as the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And then they had to do another petition. And I wondered if it was because we signed it as the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> there was the long list of schools and then it said k Tech Talk, Talk podcast <laughs> I don't all know. right the uh the other we're the news... reason for the delay <laughs> the, <cost> the delay <laughs> the uh the other thing in the news uh is the crdc uh some of you may have something to do with the crdc reporting each year or every few years uh released their report uh the educational opportunities report uh just today actually but it's important to understand that this is on the 2020-2021 civil rights data collection. So uh, it's a couple of years old in terms of the data. Uh, and we know that a lot has happened uh, in those last few years. So for the first time ever, though, uh, this report now has some data on Internet connectivity and student access to technology. So a couple of highlights here. Um, approximately 93% of public schools reported Internet connection through a fiber optic connection. Um, so the percentage of schools connected was similar for schools with low enrollments of black and Latino students as it was for high enrollments of black and Latino students. So basically, that's a really good number. We're starting to see a lot of schools with uh, strong Internet. I think that would have been dramatically lower five or 10 years ago. 95% uh, of public schools report having Wi-Fi access in every classroom. Also a very, very strong number. But then they give a map of where that uh that percentage kind of differs and i'd no, say for the no, no 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 that's that map this is, is the, the fiber. fiber optic yeah yes yeah yeah so this there's a map of the united states with all the states in different colors uh and it's showing uh the states with high percentages or based on their percentage of of schools connected with fiber the vast majority of the country is 90 to 100 percent connected to fiber there are two outliers two states that have um again this is 2020 20 2021, uh, but one state is between 50 and 59% of schools connected to fiber. And it is Josh's uh, <laughs> home away from home, my, the state of Alaska. My new vacation spot. Um, I can only imagine a big part of that is just oh. accessibility to yeah. fiber in a, in a place like Alaska. Yeah. Mooses don't have fiber on them. Right. Now, the other one that for me, it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> that is what I is, just said. Yes. Was, that doesn't make sense. But the other state that was just, I, I, I was not expecting this, was the state that has between 60 and 69% of schools connected to fiber is Florida. Yeah. Hmm. Of all states, I thought that Florida would be a little bit more uh, up to date with their I, infrastructure to schools. Kind of surprised by that as well. Yeah. Uh, and there are a handful of other schools that have lower, but again, most uh, of the country, uh, 48 out of 50 states, um, have between 80 and, and 100% of, of schools connected to fiber. So looking at this, one of the things that strikes me with some of the school, some of the states that are really low, um, Idaho, Montana, Alaska specifically, very mm -hmm. rural states that probably have schools out in the middle of nowhere that don't like you said mark don't have the infrastructure i know for a fact alaska um there's a good part of that state that doesn't have electricity um so yeah some of that's expected or explainable florida really shocks me yeah 
The last stat, though, is around 91,700 public schools provided a total of 47 million Wi-Fi enabled devices. So that's anything from a computer to a tablet to a laptop. Um, uh, and 87 percent of schools report allowing those students to take it home. Now, that number is this is the first time these numbers have been collected and reported. I really wish we could have known what that was like pre-COVID. Because um, right. yeah. I can't imagine that number was at all, or was was heavily. In, uh, that, I can imagine that number was heavily influenced by COVID. Um, I'm really, really curious to see where that number goes the next time the report, because I do see more and more schools pulling back and bringing devices in in her, in house, uh, as opposed to doing take homes. So th it's a it's a fascinating snapshot to see this report. And it'll be really interesting to see the next one where this goes. So. Yeah, I agree completely. And that's it for the news. Uh, we'll move on to the next segment. Wait. Oh, no, we, sorry. We got to pay the bills, Mark. Jeez. Oh, sorry. Chris, why don't you tell us about state of <laughs> Yeah, go get a drink. Let us pay. <laughs> let Chris pay the bills. Um, Chris, tell us about Status Gator. Yeah, so we've been hanging out with Status Gator. Uh, this is the third episode, hanging out with them. Uh, I was in, logged into Status Gator this week, uh, checking out. Uh, my different services, my different websites that I had it tracking. Uh, and we want you to check out Status Gator. A new Status Gator is here. I mentioned this before. Uh, Josh and I had demoed Status Gator a year plus ago. It looks a lot different, more features aimed at K-12 than it ever did before. Uh, and it, it's good. And there's a lot of educational apps and websites, uh, services listed in there. Again, it's it's meant for uh, K-12. You can go to statusgator.com slash K-12 podcast. Uh, they have different plans uh, that you can get into. They are affordable for schools. Uh, so re rather than sign up, you know, you think about all the websites, all the services, all the applications that you use, rather than go out to all of those things and sign up for their outages and have to pay attention to their emails or go to their status pages, Status Gator will do all that work uh, for you. Uh, and two, they do webinars every month. Uh, so if you're wanting to check them out, uh, you can sign up for a free webinar, of course. They'll show you how uh, they have like a page that you can pump out to your faculty staff that literally shows everything that you have running. So if Clever is down, you can go to the Status Gator page for your district. Uh, your teachers can know that uh, Clever is down without them having to reach out and get support kind of thing. So check out Status Gator. Uh, there is at least one, I think it was one or two on K-12 Tech Pro on the community uh, mentioning that they reached out to Status, Status Gator for pricing for a demo. So uh, do that. Mention us. Uh, they've been a pleasure to hang out with for the last three weeks. And don't confuse them with Status Dial, Status Crocodile. It's Status Gator. True. Uh, Statusgator.com slash K-12 Tech. I got so many jokes. Um, just wait for it in it. Uh, let's see. Listener email. Mark, you found a, a pretty heavy Reddit thread, didn't you? Yeah. So uh we we like to peruse the Reddit K12 sysadmin and we found some some interesting conversations to talk about. And there's one that I I don't know about you, but I, I had I I really felt for the person uh writing this and reading all the comments because I think we've all been there. Uh, the title of the post was Working Without Purpose. Um, and it's a it's a person who uh, obviously is a K-12 uh, tech in a school and is wondering, what am I here for? What are, What is our role? Am I here to educate people on how to use technology better? Am I here to improve processes, resolve issues proactively? Or am I just here to fix things and, and driving myself crazy and I'm just here to survive? So you know, this person, you know, really struggled with understanding how to go about IT in, in K-12 and, and wondered how other people feel. And there was a lot of, um, you know, really positive comments from the list from the other uh, readers. Uh, there are some really good advice from folks as well. I think we've all been there where we're wondering, what are we doing here? Are we actually improving the lives of our students and teachers or are we just here to, 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 to fix something when it breaks? So, uh, wanted to hear what you guys have to say on this one. And, and is there, were there any comments that resonated with you? And this is from tech row man, C three R. We'll give him a shout out there too. And he said a quote, right? A clever man looks to change the world, but a wise man looks within. Oh, 
I mean, he went, he did go deep on this post. He did. He did. So, Chris, what do you think? Well, I mean, it touches on the reason that I'm even on a podcast <laughs> or that we have K-12 Tech Pro or we mentioned the Midwest Tech Talk conferences, all that stuff. Um, if I only did my school district, um, I start twitching. And if I only did what's expected of me, but I'm wired this way, right? And that's why I think this guy is wired differently than maybe a lot of techs are. Or maybe all techs are wired this way, and that's why we got into tech. Uh, but we want to have an impact. Uh, we 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 want to do more than just fix a like a tech problem. Uh, you do want to be a part of a bigger cause of a thing. Uh, so those are good thoughts to have. Yeah. Uh, so, and I've talked about it in our in a, a tech department I was with before. It's hard, right? When you have maybe you have administration that puts the bar low. So like you're you can do your job and it's pretty easy to pull off your job but you you twitch you want to do more mm -hmm. you see processes that are broken you want to fix them you see policies that are policies but they're not actually being followed so that that makes you ask questions and want to do bigger yeah um, that's a good thing yeah Josh that's that's my opening yeah <laughs> oh I, I, oh <laughs> that's your opener you're not done okay <laughs> keep going no I'll, I'll I'll get some feedback here I think it's, you know, Mark said it, we've all, we've all been there and I think it's all very cyclical. Um, you know, you go through stretch stretches of time where you're like, I, the, no one's valuing the product that, that me and my team are putting out. Um, yeah. and then you go through stretches of time where you're hitting on all cylinders and you feel like things are going right. And at the end of the day, you're not going home and cracking open a beer. Um, mm -hmm but it's interesting to find that medium. And I don't know that you can't, like I said, it, it, because it feels like it's cyclical. I don't know that you can force it. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you can force that average, you know, like you're going to have mm -hmm. those ups and downs yeah. in a department. And, and a lot of that is going to be depending on the time of year too, because you know, at the beginning of the year, it's going to be crazy. People just, because people are coming back, they're coming off of vacation, some things aren't going to work. That that stress level, that, you know, what are you doing? Why? Are, what, what do you even do? Mentality is probably greater than it is middle of the year when you're able to work on special projects but not cause outages or address, like Chris said, policy issues or training issues. Um, and then you have the summer where you're either going crazy doing big projects and you're seeing your the fruits of your labors of replacing systems or replacing switches or firewalls or infrastructure type projects you're seeing those pay off but then you start to question okay is anyone else noticing what we've just spent two and a half months doing right. um yeah i don't know it it's i think i i would venture to guess that almost everyone in this field experiences all of that yeah I, I think it's, you know, you, you've got to find what, you know, makes you uh, get out of bed in the morning and, and what is it that, that excites you about the job. And, and we're all going to have um, really, really frustrating days. And I think uh, it's also helpful to know that everybody on your team is going to have really frustrating days as well. I, I think for me, the thing that makes me tick is, it, it to be honest with you, is the small stuff. I, I, I often get asked, like, why are you doing that? That's that's not your job or, you know, that's beneath you. We have other people to do that. And I'm like, you have no idea how um, uh, energized I get when I can solve a small problem because we're, we're facing so many big problems every day that just can't be fixed or are going to take months or years to resolve and sometimes never do get resolved. So for me, solving a small little tech thing is, is, is what keeps me going during the day. So I really do like to do the small things. Um, and I, I, I think the, the thing I try to set the expectation for is if I'm called into a discussion or a problem where someone's like, can you just do this or, or I need you to do this and kind of using me as the, and there's a quote in here, the, the computer custodian. Um, I, I try to say, let's take a step back. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? And before we apply a solution to that, let me understand what you're trying to resolve. And I will do my best to, to, to dig down into all of our tools, all of our suites of tools and systems and say, you know, is there something better that I can introduce this person to uh, that they're not familiar with? So before you just ask for a checkbox on the student information system for this particular task, 
tell me about the problem we're trying to solve and, and I really want to be a part of the solution, whether or not it's a technical change or, or not. So those are the kinds of things that, that keep me going. But I will say that there are plenty of days where you're mm -hmm. just like, what am I doing here? It just feels like people are only bringing you problems and they're never um, really viewing you as a strategic partner. So I feel that. Um, and uh, uh, I will say that one quote that I love the best on this was, everyone wants to be Superman. I want to be Batman, the superhero that no one sees until something bad happens. So. That was my favorite part. Well, let's go back to Chris. He he finished. Yeah, his he needs and... to finish. Yeah, I was gonna do a bit. Hold on, I gotta. I am justice. Is that Batman? Is that good? Oh, that was Batman. <laughs> Tell me, do you bleed? You will. Is that good? I don't. I don't know that that's appropriate for work. <laughs> that's a quote from Batman versus Superman. Anyway. It makes me think we're going through infinite campus uh, migration. Tyler Sis, the infinite campus, Fun, tons of it? meetings. Yes, it's terrible. Uh, and I actually had, I guess this is, I'm going to be a little fragile here for a second. Uh, had this meeting. This has probably been maybe a month ago. Door shut, uh, Zoom call, infinite campus training going on. Sis coordinator, me, them, uh, two ladies with IC. And it was about two, three hours. And all we talked about was the calendar and the bell schedule and passing time uh, and minutes. And like, it sucked. It was terrible. Uh, and I'm just the person that's facilitating the meeting and like, you know, making sure that the team is doing what we're supposed to do the whole bit uh, and being that person to make sure that we're going to do a good job, right? Uh, but in the moments of that, I forget that. And I just, it sucks that I'm in this stupid meeting about the calendar and passing time and stuff I don't care about. And I actually turned off my mic, turned off the camera, and I stood up in the office and I went, ah! <laughs> and no one was around to give me comfort. Uh, and then I sat back down and did the professional thing for all the rest of the meeting. But uh, I am reminded uh, because I went through it when they're kicking our timeline around and the whole bit. The bigger picture thing going on is that I'm facilitating that our school district has success uh, with the new sis that we're moving towards. So so I can take that little battle and maybe I lost that one even, uh, at least in my headspace I did. Uh, but I am going to make sure that our district, for the good of the cause stuff, is happening at all times. Uh, that That's my role in it. I love what Mark said about the small stuff. Uh, that's easy. Uh, I, I think I struggle with, in my job... And it's, again, how my head works, too. I just, I do my job and I forget about the relationships uh, that you can have and the fun sure. that you can have along with your job. Uh, there's teachers that are literally down the hall from me that many years went by before I really, like, got to know them. And that's super stupid uh, because a lot of those folks are my age and we have a ton of stuff in common. Uh, but I only look at them as users and I'm going to fix their computer problems and stuff. So getting that, like, don't forget you work at a school district and you're helping kids like grow up. Uh, there's tons of lessons. You're, you're helping facilitate kids growing up and kids be, becoming successful later in life. Uh, but you're, you're also can just, you, you can also just be there to have relationships with the other adults uh, that are going through stuff just the same. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I've always thought like, could I survive in the, private sector and I, I have had very limited limited experience in the private sector and I think the thing that keeps me going in in education is that you're surrounded by people whose entire career is based on somebody else's success right teachers are successful when their students do well when their students are successful it's not about profit it's not about like sales right. and you know gaining customers it's you're really surrounded by an entire community that they do well when somebody else uh, accomplishes their goals and, and does well in life. And that's, you know, it, the day-to-day -day drudgery is really hard. Uh, but overall you are part of something more important. It's really hard to see the forest through the trees though. So thank you. And te Technomancer. CR3. See, no, that's, that's lead speech. Oh, oh Chris. What's um, it called? If is that Lee? Oh, I'm screwing this one up. But when you do a, th a three instead of a num uh, the letter E, 
I I know that, but I don't know what I didn't know there was a term for that. Yeah. <laughs> Someone told me the term riz the other day. You guys heard that before? Yes. I have high school kids. <laughs> um hey, also your job can suck. If the money's good, be content, take the paycheck and then figure out the stuff outside of your job that doesn't suck and pursue all that. Yeah, make plans for post retirement. I, you know, Mark, I think you hit on an interesting uh, point. Hit the riz, man. Let's look that up. I'll look that up. Private sector coworkers are completely different from like what Chris was saying about getting to know teachers more from a, not necessarily a user perspective, but a human perspective. Um, I think in, in a private sp- sector, that is completely different. And I think from a IT to user relationship that user relationship is more prominent than what chris was trying to accomplish with the teachers down the hall i think for whatever reason it's it might be a little bit easier to have that personal relationship with teachers than it is quote unquote users in the private sector having spent some time in the private sector half my career um it's just it's just a different environment i think i've told this story before i wasn't on the job a couple months and there was kind of a tense exchange uh, between me and, and another coworker and the superintendent called me in and he's like, Hey, don't, we don't, I just want make sure you're okay. Don't look at leaving. That's not how things go around here. I'm like, dude, no, this is nothing. I'm not getting calls at two in the morning about a printer, not printing or a physician throwing a phone at me. It, this is, this is <laughs> nothing. Um, so yeah, K-12 environments are completely different than private sector environments. Wow. Doctors are mean in Missouri. Doc- dude, go work in a healthcare environment for dude. 10 years. Yeah. Dude. Hey, wow. so in my office, uh, so, St- so Stephanie in my house, um, <laughs> so growing up, my, my mother would wait, give me, a nut- wait, wait. I, I'll, I'll get there. Hold on. My my mother would give me a nutcracker every year at Christmas. Okay. And then I met Stephanie and she hated my nutcracker collection. <laughs> uh, and then I married Stephanie and I brought my nutcracker collection along with me. And my mom knows this about Stephanie. So she still gives me a nutcracker <laughs> every single Christmas. Uh, so Stephanie doesn't allow me to have those around the house. <laughs> so this week in the office, I decorated the office with over 40 nutcrackers. Oh, I, I want to back up to how you started the conversation with describing Stephanie as Stephanie in my house. Well, that's what she is to me when she doesn't (laughs) let me do what I want in the house. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, by the way, a follow up to last week's episode. Um, yesterday was my mom's birthday. Uh, oh yeah, and and she listened to last week's episode. What's her name again? That it's not it's not for this. Yeah, you know. happy birthday, Mark's mom. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so yes, on her birthday, she found out that I have a new so tattoo. Who told so her, who who told her to listen? Did you tell her to listen? Did your brother didn't didn't tell her. Nope, didn't. Nope, she found it on her own. So and she sent you a text that said something like rebellious Mark and his tattoos. <laughs> You haven't spoken to her since, though? Uh, well, Thanksgiving's coming up, so this will be interesting. <laughs> That's funny. Josh, have you added Mark's mom on Facebook? I have what? not. We are not Wait, friends. Guy, what? Wait. Do you off. think she would accept? No. <laughs> no. Mark, you can friend my mom. No. <laughs> it's weird because I'm looking at her profile pic right now. Okay, Chris, why don't, let's let's not just dis- let's distract him, Mark. Uh, Chris, why don't you tell us about? We've already mentioned him that Chris wanted to look at Fortinet uh, firewalls. Chris, why don't you tell us real quick about Fire uh, Fortinet since we've already mentioned him. Once. Fortinet, a proud sponsor of the K Twelve Tech Talk podcast. Uh, you can email Chris over at Fortinet at Fortinet Podcast at Fortinet dot com. All right. So our main topic tonight, uh, managing student accounts. And this is, uh, we've been seeing some conversation around this, uh, a couple different groups I'm in. And I actually had a phone conversation with a 
a neighboring district yesterday about some of this um, managing student accounts. And, and really you could expand this to staff faculty and staff accounts as well. Um, I came across the main tool that I use GAM G A M. If you're not using GAM, you need to be using GAM. Um, there's also a flavor called GAM ADV. Chris, you use GAM, right? I am a gammer. Um, so I started using GAM shoot almost probably 10 years ago when I started here, uh, to create that rash of kindergarten accounts at the beginning of the year and, and transfer yeah. accounts at the beginning of the year. So instead of manually creating 400 accounts, I can feed a CSV into GAM, run a, run a command, and it's creating student accounts based on OU, based on graduation year and the appropriate OU and the appropriate building, yada, 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 in the span of 15 minutes. It's mm -hmm. created all my accounts, one-stop shop. Um, but it does other stuff. Chris, what have you used GAM to do? I would run it periodically uh, to make sure that all of my, like you just talked about the OUs, and also uh, to make sure they're members of all the groups that they're supposed to be a part oh. of. Yeah. Uh, so I would just have some commands ready to go that I knew I just needed to change a couple of characters in it to run it properly. Uh, I still use it quickly. Uh, if a teacher wants to reset a password, whatever, it's easy for me to uh, sometimes like I'm not changing their password, but the next time they log in, they're forced to change their password. You can do a quick game command for that. Those are two two quick things. And you There's can you can go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry. I was going to say, there's some good reports as well. So not just doing things, but you can actually use it to query uh, your Google Workspace environment and pull data out, pull reports of, you know, groups or files that, that have certain characteristics. So. Oh, yeah. We had, a, we had a rash of kids housing MP4 files in Google Drive of potentially copyrighted materials. Um, so you can say, Gam, go run a query against uh, this OU's drive with, uh avi files or mpeg4 file something like that and it'll return in a in a either on the screen or you can tell it to dump to drive or dump to a csv of all the files that it found um just the other day i used it to add a co-teacher to a to a classroom uh set forwarding email accounts um it's super powerful and gam adv is a flavor <clears throat> somebody's added some features um, to it and it does some it has all the functionality of regular gam but then has added feature sets on top of it so uh, it is a command line tool and i know that turns some people off uh, you can do some of that stuff with some sheet plugins and stuff like that but you have to pay for it gam's free you just have to uh, attach it to your workspace instance and and away you go i was gonna um, say it's free it is scary Oh yeah. Um, but even all those commands and stuff, there's a GAM has a good community too of people that are posting uh on websites, you know, here's here's the great commands to use. So one of the frustrating things that we've come across was um, you know, we we buy up Google Workspace. So we we have Education Plus or whatever whatever it's called now. Um, and we found out that when you like a kid transfers out or graduates, whatever and you suspend that account, that when you suspend that account, it doesn't remove the license from that account. So GAM, you can run a script and it'll go in and remove, you can tell it, find all of the suspended accounts in this OU. And if it has this license applied to it, remove it. Uh, so you can do nested queries and nested nice. commands like that. Um, yeah, we were finding files that were publicly shared that, don't need to be publicly shared and we were running gam commands against them to to remove that right uh, i think it's i think it's good to get your feet wet in command line tools it's good to you know it's it's really more of a chainsaw approach you can just you know make massive changes and and, and upload changes rather quickly but when it comes to managing student accounts i would really push you to try to move towards some sort of automated tool uh, that doesn't depend on a command line that that if you're out on vacation that sure. the tool can still run um, and you have this kind of in your back pocket for those unique circumstances but I would I would encourage you if you are using GAM for day-to-day -day tasks if you can find a more vendor support or off-the-shelf product to do that I know that it sometimes is cost prohibited 
cross prohibitive. Um, that way, when you're on vacation, you can take a vacation, right? I, and I, I always, I, I've got my gentleman who I know is, is an expert with GAM and I'm always encouraging him, like, you're going to go on your summer vacation and you're not going to worry about all the other things because we can take care of the other things. Whereas if you have too much script in a command line tool like GAM, right. um, you're not relaxing on vacation. You are thinking about, did I run that script? Do I need to go and log in and VPN and run that script? So, um, that's the that's my word of caution around GAM is just an over dependency or over reliance on it. Buzzkill. So, yeah. You, wow. Way to be, Mark. <laughs> you could always schedule it with Windows Scheduler, Mark. PowerShell it. Okay. Um. So student account <laughs> passwords. Uh, I know we've talked about this. It's probably been a while, but we've had some recent. It's been a while. We've Stained, had... early two thousands. Um, when <laughs> we we continue to have discussions about when it's appropriate or what age level is it appropriate for, uh, to expect students to reset passwords for their Google accounts, um, you know, clearly high school level high school kids can handle changing their password and remembering a password. Middle school level, I think it's appropriate. Um, mm. Intermediate, intermediate. Really? Are you kidding me? Mm. Come on. We've reached our first uh, disagreement. Keep going, Josh. Uh, intermediate level, and and I, you know, some of these terms are kind of ubiquitous. Um, intermediate level for areas around us are typically fourth, fifth grade, or third, fourth, fifth grade. Um, I think there's a little bit of a gray area there. You know, those younger kids, third, fourth grade probably would have a harder time. Uh, fifth grade, I think you're definitely getting into that space where they can remember a password. Uh, and the, the conversation that I come back to is the majority of these kids at that age group all have social media accounts, multiple social media accounts, but they all probably have the same password. Xbox accounts, PlayStation Network accounts, that that kind of stuff. So to have this rationalization that they can't remember a password, I, I have a hard time buying into that rationalization. Um, so what do you, what do you guys think? What, what's the, an age appropriate password reset time frame? Do you think? I'm going to, I'm going to wait for Chris. Cause he already has his thoughts. He's hedging on middle school. What do you think? I, um, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm not th- I don't I don't think that kids can't change their passwords um but I think we have a lot of you know we have I don't know 30 40 applications uh their Google account their Windows account uh their their student information system account we have a lot of accounts SSO, SSO. yeah sure um, so you try to streamline all that cause you're battling losing, you know, instructive minutes Sure. Uh, because these kids have changed their passwords and are not remembering. So even when you get to that large percentage that can handle it, you're still making a whole lot of problems when you're, you're, you're introducing problems, you're introducing tech tickets, uh, when you have to worry about password resets. Uh, so I think, I think I agree with you about the age. I think, of course, a high school kid can handle a password. I think there's high school kids that can't handle a password sure. reset. So right. when, you, when you introduce force resets, okay, these kids are no problems. Uh, but it's that whole big conversation. I mean, it's really easy, convenient to do. This is the scheme we use for passwords for every kid. Uh, so teacher knows what the password's going to be. Well, and that's... Uh, when we reset it, we reset it to what we say it's going to be. We can do automation tools like Mark's talking about that make sure that that password is going to be that every single day. Um, I you don't know. know. I I think the the problem that we've seen, and I know there's a couple of districts around us that have seen it. When you when you stick to that standard, it doesn't take a rocket scientist in fifth grade to figure out his buddy's password. Um. And we've we've ran into problems or had problems where a kid is logging in as another kid because they know the convention, they know that kid's password, they can log in and send 
a ridiculous email to the assistant principal. You know, like that's a problem. So to me, when by the when they're that age, whatever that age is, and it seems to be around fifth grade for us, sixth grade for us, that's the age where okay, it's now time to have a conversation about passwords and and changing your password and what that means. Um, because I I think, you know, it it doesn't take too much googling to figure out that the longer you roll with that stale password the more exposed you are um for a number of reasons yeah mark what do you think um i mean i think we we've learned a lot over the years um with you know in the beginning it was all about getting kids online and and, and ease of access and uh and security really has uh taken a front seat to convenience now um, and a, a compromised account in your environment is a compromised account. And I think yeah. we need to stop differentiating between, you know, a student, uh, yep. in the high school and a kindergarten and a staff member, because at the end of the day, a compromised account, uh, is a compromised account. And there are, there are things you can do to minimize it. Uh, the damage of, of a student's account being in the wrong hands. Um, but at the end of the day, that's your name on the domain. Um, and so I think, the, the way I would recommend it is the second a student can handle setting a compl complex password, then they should be. Um, that's a really, really hard pill to swallow, though, because you could say, oh, we're going to train all of our first and second graders how to reset a password. <laughs> and, if they just, and if they reset it to um, dog and pony, uh, you've made things so much worse. Um you know, we've had situations where, you know, we've we've had a student reset their password because of a compromise and he reset it back to what it was before. Sure. So Smart. I think at, at the at the age that a student is able to handle a complex password, they should start doing that. I think that's upper elementary school. Um, but that means that before that, you need to treat those accounts very differently. And Mark, uh, define I, what upper elementary means to you. I mean, I would say fourth and fifth grade. Okay. Um, and I'll say that for two reasons. The first is that's the, the age when students can remember a unique password uh, and they're more inclined to set something uh, on their own. Um, the other thing is that at that grade level, they start to explore third party applications and they start to use things on their own. Uh, and But they're not at the level where if I go off on my own and I set up a TikTok account and I use uh, my email and password, even if, if your domain is locked down and not allow those kinds of things, students are still going to carry their password from personal accounts over to their, their school account or vice versa. Um, and so I think that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, if you're doing third grade, perfect situation, whatever, perfect scenario, how often are they asked to change that password? Um, I think a minimum of one year, uh, passwords need to be changed and rotated. Um, and, and if you don't know why, um, the best website that I've been able to find that, that demonstrates this is the Have I Been Pwned. Um, Which uh, now uses... charges. No, I just used it today. It doesn't charge. Mm. Oh. Uh, if you're not familiar with this one, it uses Leet Speech, which is why I, I, I Googled it. Leet, Leet. Right for a Leet. Um, and you can put an email address in there and we'll tell you if it's been breached. And you can kind of see if you put in yours or, or another email address, you can kind of see through the years when that account has been compromised or, or, or found in a breach. Um, and that will give you a pretty good idea of like, oh, definitely one year is, is the longest I would wait before resetting a password. What's that website again? Have I been pwned? We'll put that Have in the show You never heard notes. of that, Chris? Yeah, I was just trying to, you know, help you guys. <laughs> Um, Chris, I want you to go to that website and put in your uh, personal email address for me, and we're just going to watch your reaction. On the, as far as them charging goes, I think they're char they're not charging for individual account lookups now. They're they're charging for uh, domain lookups. I think, Mark. So when you you used to be able to do, you know, I own this domain. Got tell it. me what accounts have been pwned out of this domain, and it would give you a report whenever something would get pwned. Um, Does it tell me what sites? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. And it tells you in some cases what information was included in that breach. So, let's see here. While he's looking, let's, let's 11 look. 11 data breaches, that seems pretty low. <laughs> Maybe. Man, this is a little glimpse of my history too. MySpace on there. 
uh, dub smash. <laughs> you guys are were you guys ever on there? No, we weren't an aspiring recording artist. No. Um. So MySpace, while Chris, shoot. While, while Chris is looking back through his internet history from the last twenty years, um, suspend versus deleting accounts. So this this conversation came up today with a group I was in. Um, there was the discussion of how long are you holding on to retired faculty, faculty that have left, uh, graduated students, students that have transferred. Those accounts might be suspended or you suspend them when they leave. But how long are you holding on to them before you delete them? Um, and I think the big red flag here, at least with Google, is that if you delete the account, that data then goes missing or is deleted out of vault. And you cannot do a search on it anymore. So uh, I don't know if you guys want to talk about what you do for deletion purposes, but uh, yeah, if you're, if you're getting ready to delete an account, know that if you have Google, it's that all of that stuff is then gone out of vault. And that is why we never delete accounts. You've never deleted a graduated student account? Nope. Interesting. Nope. Students nor staff do not delete accounts, only suspend. My, and of course, the easy thing to say here is look at your board policy, look at right. to see what retention you're supposed to have. So we 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 do not delete staff. And I think there's like a, I feel like it's 10 years at my school district for how long we're supposed to keep email, that kind of thing, whatever. So we could clean that out after 10. And you can make vault rules that say get rid of stuff after X amount of years or whatever. And But students, we wait one year after they've graduated, like the March after they've graduated and we delete their accounts. You you suspend their accounts right after graduation though? Or no, we leave them open for correspondence to still happen uh, after graduation until the March. Oh. Because our counselors reach out to them. And there's some kind of state reporting bit on yeah. post-graduation stuff. That's they the email account they use uh, to have that correspondence happen. We move them to a graduated OU that has different settings applied to them. They can't email students. They can only email staff. And it, and it stays on until, I guess it's the March. So it, yeah, the graduate in May, June, whatever. And then in March is when they are deleted. Hmm. Interesting. We typically suspend them right after graduation, unless there's a reason. And then we hold on to them for a year, at least a year. And that way we catch any of those kids that were in the wrong OU that didn't graduate. They come back the next day of school and they can't log in, you know. Uh, interesting. Let's see. Chris, you want to tell us about Visor, our final sponsor for tonight? I do. And then I want to come back to something that I got riled up about while you guys were talking about other things. Okay. Visor, a proud sponsor of the K-12 Tech Talk podcast. Uh, they released a new major, a new major version over the summer. Over sixty new features that can help you manage your Chromebooks. Uh, they can automate Chromebook power washing. Uh, they can do some stuff with uh, giving you information about recent logins. Uh, they have a new rules engine uh, that helps you automate. Kind of what we talked about. Like yeah. let's get into automation to push OU stuff around. Uh, so K-12 Tech Talk listeners can get up to 20% off uh, if you go to visor.cloud slash K-12 Tech Talk. That's visor, V-I-Z-O-R dot cloud slash K-12 Tech Talk. You guys, um, the people watching our stream now that we've got video going again, um, they'll notice this. You, the, our new studio looks amazing. It like does we, look pretty cool. We painted the walls. It's nice. the studio looks great. So <laughs> anyway, are you guys trashing? So if I'm a school district and I'm doing initials and launch pen, yeah, as my password, and I'm not really looking to change. Um, are you guys like you're trashing on me right now, or do you still feel what I'm no, saying about convenience I, and the whole bit? So, What's the is there any give in that opinion? I'll I'll just say this when I was in admin console this week looking at context aware alerts something that i found a field that will tell you um strong or weak password for for accounts and i did i did a little bit of reading in the admin console handbook on 
what strong password really means from Google's perspective. And they're pretty clear that strong doesn't necessarily mean complex. It means that it's a hard to, hard to guess password and hasn't been seen in a password dump like on have I been pwned or something like that. So Chris, the stance I would take there would be if those accounts are deemed strong by Google or, okay, let's look at it from the other way. If they've been deemed as weak by Google, that's a bigger concern than not. Meaning it's likely that that password has been exposed in a dump somewhere. And that would, to me, that would be rationale for ch for that person to change that password. Um, I think a convention is a convention, you know, and if that's what's easy and that's what you've done, okay. But I think you need to take steps to, if if there are weak ones or if Google is telling you, hey, we've seen this somewhere, I think that's uh, worth paying attention to. Mark, do you have an opinion? Nope. Okay. I got Why do I care? It's a student Google account. Who cares? Mark, you, you want to know... send them to the website? <laughs> you want to send them to the website to go read the articles, Mark? <laughs> yeah. You know it's a student password. Other people... I'm sorry, not a password. You know it's a student account. Other yep. people do not know it's a student account. So we've seen vendors trying to be fished with accounts that they think are us when in reality they're not us they're not staff uh -oh. so i think that's the important thing right is that when i say that uh, and i said earlier it's your name on that domain that's what i mean by that 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 a student's uh, uh account to other people who don't know that it's a student they're going to treat that with a higher level of respect sure. um, because they think that it's a real account or that's okay. a staff so i'm, I'm going to say something and you two are going to get mad at me. Oh, God. That wouldn't be an issue if you didn't let students email outside the domain. Just yeah, but well, they, we well, and, about but, this. And then you're getting into the whole deal. So student account gets compromised and they email a teacher. The yeah, teacher right. is clicking a link quick because it's a kid. Right. right. Yeah. It still it still happens within the within it. We've had we've had staff we have different emails for our students and staff, and we've had staff who didn't realize that. So really so yeah no I, I i agree josh like reducing the um the the risk yeah. by um by not allowing students to email outside the domain that's a very very common practice for people to do but it doesn't eliminate it it reduces no, I the risk agree there's still a risk i i was just gonna say something that struck me we were looking at drive settings this week something that i changed this week i hadn't thought about it turning off the ability to share outside the domain for substitutes Substitute didn't need to share outside the domain. Why? You know, okay. Check that that those accounts can't do that anymore. I think that's an easy fix. And how many listeners email us? Let us know. K twelve tech talk at gmail dot com. Has has that ever crossed your mind? What other what other sh sharing settings have you put in place that uh, we might not be thinking of? But that that sharing outside the domain one was like, yeah, why? Our subs don't need that. Our our maintenance workers don't need that. The bus people don't need that. You know, so I think you could get pretty granular on some of that stuff. I have one setting that I I really really want. This will this would be my birthday present if if Google were to release mm -mm. this. And it's not even about security. I am so sick and tired of Google Forms, and I want the ability to turn off the ability to turn off the option of creating Google Forms. Oh, but unfortunately in Google. If you turn that off, you turn off the ability for somebody to fill out a Google form. Why do you hate Google Forms, Mark? I'm What's tired up, of buddy? Google. I, I, people create them for, for everything under the sun. I, what do you want for lunch today? Well, I've made a Google Form for you to collect what you want for lunch today. <laughs> we're, we're just overwhelmed with Google Forms. <laughs> Why is that a bad thing, Mark? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you if you make a Google Form and I'll submit all my reasons <laughs> why I hate Google Forms. Trust me. If you are in my district and you're hearing me right now, you know what I'm talking about. I feel, you know, I feel for you. We got a lot of I, Google Forms out I, there. I feel like there's a little... Uh, that was a lot. There's that a little a therapy that needs to happen <laughs> over Google Forms and Mark, I think. We got a lot why, of... Why are we here? 
to fill out a Google form. To fill out a Google form. Interesting. What's I'm, your I'm form? The... What's your form? Like, what's your what's your go to then? It, it's 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 the overload of forms, but I will say the other part of it is Doodle Poll. He likes uh, Doodle Poll instead of Google <laughs> Forms. I hate <laughs> poorly created forms. Now, if you if you make a Google form, there's a there's a setting to say just collect the email address. Now nope. people turn that on, and I'm then they add a, and then they add a field that yep. says what's your email address. Yeah, I can't, I can't, I I. I no, no, I can't do that. Or, and the most common one, because we're a very large Tell school, us how you feel, Mark. And we have a lot of schools, an open text box for school name. I, I can't do it. There's there's a there's a, a manageable set of values. Use a dropdown. But you no, have like 600 schools, open. Mark. That would take forever to type. You can copy paste. You mm. can copy paste them in there. Or even just like, I don't know, gender. And you're going to do an open text box for... Well, we won't get in there. That's too political. But I was going to say, say, Mark. (laughs) (laughs) But anyways, you know what I mean, right? It's poorly designed forms, and it's just way too many of them. And that sounds like you need to lead. You need to lead a training on how to create a Google form, Mark. Is that the name of the episode? Mark discusses gender. No, Mark, I just, have you I, have you been that guy that uses the opportunity of those open text box fields to input an invalid or snarky email mm. address or building name? Um, I am guilty of when somebody <laughs> asks for my email address, but it's already collecting. I will write, "You already have my email at <laughs> gmail.com. I'm that guy, so I'm sorry. I love it, Mark's. Mark's outing himself with his employees about his uh, hatred for. Oh, no, no, they all know. Oh, they everybody know. knows. Everybody knows how much I hate Forbes. It's That's enough. Awesome. It's enough. Well, so. I think Mark has done a really good job to uh, close this, uh, <laughs> rant. this episode up. I, I started the episode with a rant. Mark closes the episode Ooh. with a rant. Chris kind of ranted in the middle about. My battery's his... dying. Uh oh. Oh, Lord. So it's time to quit. Uh, all right. Well, I guess we'll wrap it up then. This has been episode 144 of the K12 Tech Talk podcast. We are K12 Tech Talk, and so are you. I was going to keep going, but okay. The views and opinions expressed on the K12 Tech Talk podcast are the personal opinions of Josh, Chris, and Mark, and do not represent the views or opinions of our sponsors or other organizations that we're affiliated with. The material information presented here is for general information and entertainment purposes only. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.